Martin looks at some alternative ways in which people can get the kind of houses they really want. Myrtle Court in Liverpool 8 is typical of the inner city areas in many larger cities throughout Britain. Rejected, vandalised. The official classification calls them hard to lets, which must be the understatement of the year. Five storeys with access balconies, refuse chutes and no lifts, the council's policy is to demolish them. Even demolition costs money. Immediately next to Myrtle Court is a similar larger building called Myrtle Gardens. Interesting things have been happening there lately and a lot of people have been surprised by the results. PR men now call it Minster Court. Now what we're offering you are the best value flats in the North West. Two bedroom flat for £16,000 with a fully fitted kitchen, a fully fitted bathroom, Carpets, extremely good value for money. They're selling like hotcakes. Come and see them now. After the hard sell, let's get down to some real facts. What they've done is sold 150 out of the 200 flats already. And this is the acceptable face of capitalism. Because Sir Laurie Barrett stuck his neck out on this one against a lot of other people who were advising him not to. There were sceptics among the Barrett organisation, among local builders, local professionals and local politicians, and a lot of people thought it wouldn't work. In fact, some people set it on fire while they were doing it. Despite that, and by using local labour, and by managing the site very, very cleverly, and you must remember they're very able builders who know how to sell to a particular part of the market. And what they've done here is look at a problem and solve it by design and management. And the design consists of having security. There's a porter's lodge and there's gates and you can only come in one way and there's private staircases which in fact have locks and bells and the whole thing is thought about in terms of security and privacy and it's very successfully done. It's in fact not great architecture but it's very good value for money and it's inner city and the, the point about it being in the inner city is people still want to live here. The range of people that have bought these flats is from both the top and the bottom end of the market. There are 95% mortgages available. There are, there are professional people who work in the teaching hospital nearby. There are students. There are people who lived here when these buildings were first built in 1937. And when they were first built, they really were quite Arcadian. They were splendid buildings with good landscape. And what went wrong was the management and maintenance of these buildings. There are loads of buildings like this in Liverpool, and there's plenty of ways of doing them. Local authority could do them, other builders could do them, cooperatives could do them. What we've got is a whole range of opportunities and we need a whole range of solutions. Well, Sir Laurie Barrett no doubt will be a member of Mrs Thatcher's Tory heaven. And they did use local architects here, Kingham Knight, who I think have done a very good job. Look how enjoyable the staircase is, with this curved top, which picks up the curves on the brickwork. The existing brickwork cleaned, new planting, simple light fittings. Just very confident, very, very good, simple, straightforward conservation. Good value for money because the space is there. And one thing I want to mention is that in favour of conservation and converting old buildings is there's, there's all the existing environment there, the services, the sewers, the electrics, and the space. And the thing that worries me, and here I'm going to be a bit critical of speculative builders, is that when they build new small houses, when they do these starter units, which are very, very cleverly done, lots of furniture in, all the fittings, there's no room for anything else. In fact, there's no room to swing a cat. 
which is one of the advantages of larger, older houses, and we'll see some of them later in the programme. Well, if that was the acceptable face of capitalism in a big business way, this is certainly the acceptable face in a smaller way. This, in fact, is uh, a private cooperative. It's really a partnership between a couple, Jeff and Judy Hackman, and three other uh, young people who have flats in this house. This is, in fact, a three-bedroom house, and there are three two-bedroom flats that go with it. It was bought about four or five years ago in derelict condition, very cheaply, and has been done up very economically with the help of grants and it's delightfully converted. <clears throat> Excuse me, in fact, Jeff Hackman does the best interior conversions in Liverpool. He really is an example to housing associations who often butcher houses of this kind, and it's just delightful. It's particularly interesting there where the staircase, which comes down three floors, it's almost like a flute itself, a delightful use of space. There's bookcases in it and telephones and lights, interesting handrails, the whole thing's a beauty. This is obviously Debussy. It's about a nymph called Syrinx, who Pan chased to the edge of the, the lake, and she changed into a reed. And Pan plucked the reed and changed it into a flute. Lovely. I wish I could play the piano. In fact, unfortunately, I got stuck on a piece called a ball of cherries when I was about seven. I, in fact, memorized the music and didn't read it. Minor tragedy. My mother was very upset. I should have had a teacher like Judy Hackman, really. But anyway, we're here to look at the interior, as well as to listen to Debussy. And this is the old basement, was used as a store, wine store, things of that kind. And in fact, with the changes of level and the simple decoration and the stairs out into the garden, it shows how a, a simple basement can be converted to very, very good, usable accommodation. The studio in the house, a place for people to teach music. There's lots of interesting people in this house. This is the living room of uh, one of the two bedroom flats. It's a delightful room with an interesting kitchen and a staircase rising up to the two bedrooms above. It's got shutters. It's got a lovely Italianate marble fireplace. The terrace and the garden are out there. It's an absolute delight. And it's the individuality of this which is enjoyable. It cost the same amount of money as the Barrett flats, 16,000 pounds. Very good value in both cases. One aimed at the mass market, very carefully, middle of the road, not offending anybody. This one, a one-off, designed for an individual, by an individual, in fact, what architecture can offer. Architecture can also offer good solutions for a lot of people in a general sense, but I think you can sense which is the one that I prefer. In fact, I think I'll enjoy a cup of tea here. Would you like a cup of tea? Yes, I'd love a cup of tea, thank you. Well, there you are, it's all done. I'm going to put this here. Do you want sugar? Because uh, no I don't think you. you'll have sugar in this house. Thank you very much. No, I don't take sugar. That smells very nice. What sort of tea is it? Dorji? No, no. Well, no. actually... What? Well? It's PG, but that wasn't there. PG, this particular cup of tea, but it tastes good, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Tell by the colour of these bodies who the real workers are. I mean, architects are talkers and drawers. That doesn't mean to say they're not workers. And we are very involved in the process and involved in management systems that build buildings like this. These, in fact, are very nice, straightforward buildings. The windows are about the right proportion. They've got friendly porches. The materials are warm and friendly. The thing is, really, uh, it's a cooperative, and it, it's about families being involved in designing the houses themselves. And it's really quite a, a kind of happy place. They're building manholes here and walls up to the porches. Just getting on with it and enjoying it in the sun. Very enjoyable experience. It's nice to build. Um, it stop people bars. just walking, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, you're always going to have the thing that other people may use it. They may yeah. use it, people yeah. from Bickerton Street, but I don't think that's... Well, I, 
It'd be difficult to stop that happening. It would cause an awful lot of ill feeling if you did try to stop it happening. The people in Bickerton Street could still use it, couldn't yes. they? Well, yes, they w I think they would do anyway, and I think that that's the kind of linkage that the co-op must make with the, with the yeah, streets and places around. It's not actually blocking it off, is it? This is a good meeting in the background. It's interesting how articulate architects are when they explain schemes, and even more enjoyable how articulate people are when they're involved in the design process. Now, the whole point about this group of houses is, is, is instead of it being them and us, it's, it's everybody. The, the people who are living in these houses have been involved in the design process and they're going to be responsible for its maintenance and, and the enjoyment of it. They're currently discussing the landscape and the need for the planting that will eventually be around this circular space. And that's very, very healthy. Now, the amazing thing is, in a city like Liverpool just now, with all the problems that it's got, We've got a new Labour controlled council and they've suddenly put the blocks on housing cooperatives of this kind because they believe that municipal housing should solve all the problems. Now that's patently bloody ridiculous because what we want is a whole range of alternatives. And by the time these programmes come out in August, Liverpool Corporation may have made a sensible decision or it may have dug itself even further into the trenches of dogma because young practices like Wilkin, Wilkins and Ainsley Gommon have other jobs like this, and my own practice has one. I have one for Kent Gordon's Cooperative, which is stopped absolutely dead whilst the city fathers decide whether this sort of housing should go on. Now, <laughs> it really is, it, it, it's silly. There's plenty of sites for local authority housing. There's plenty of sites for cooperatives like this because they pay rent, and you know, they're involved in the design process, and there's plenty of sites for private sector housing. And what we want is a whole range of solutions, not one sort, neither right nor left wing. Liverpool's got enough problems without squabbling over them. And I think the mood of this meeting is what it really is about. Architecture's for people. It's a background, and it's got to be there for them to enjoy. It's not an architect's ego trip, and neither is it a political statement, just, just as such. It's got to be both. It might be about politics, but it's principally about people, and these people are involved in the process, and that can only be healthy. We need more of this sort of thing. And I asked him what his view would be of us appealing against that, whether we would win. He said, well... If there's one thing the British enjoy, it's mucking about in boats. And wouldn't it be great to live on the banks of a river, or on the banks of a canal like this one, the Shropshire Union? I'm about four miles south of Chester. And these look like very interesting houses. Quite modern, straightforward, and I think very successful. I wouldn't mind living in a house like this. I'm gonna take a closer look at them. Now what's really good about these houses is that the builders, Mr. Farrington and Mr. Smith, and their architect, John Tweed of Chester, have designed individual houses for people who buy them. And the people that buy them design their own interiors. And some are two stories and some are three stories. And some people live on the ground floor and some have decided to have their living rooms on the first floor. Some have granny flats below and a two-story house above. And each one of them's different. And the balconies are different and the interior layout's different. They design their own kitchens, their own bathrooms. And I think even though they're expensive, they're very good value for money. Very, very good architecture which reflects the needs of the people that are paying for it, which is superb. And there's other lovely touches. I mean, look how delightful the, the planting is against the canal. These are called Prince of Wales feathers, a lovely colour. And look at the colour because it reminds me of this pond here, which is full of lovely little goldfish, which are going to grow bigger with time and probably get pet names. And they're going to be admired by children and grandchildren, and people that come and see them. I'm going to try and catch one and bring one out and show it to you. Now, the one thing about eating live goldfish is you've got to bite the head off first. And put them into the canal, something like that. Nice lunch. I'm going to have a look inside now. This is the second floor of one of the houses, and I'm just going up to a kind of studio level, up a very interesting small spiral staircase. And what I think you, is important, and what you've got to remember, is that there isn't another space like this anywhere else in England or anywhere in Europe because it's been individually designed by an architect dealing with an individual who has had particular requirements. Here we're in the roof space. 
You quite small rooms, but very, very cottagey, full of charming detail, nice little railings and so on, hardwood, she doesn't need painting. And the whole thing is individual, and that's the important thing. And what I want to know is why we can't have more builders doing this, because they sell. Now, it requires a lot more management. The builder has to be committed. It requires a heck of a lot more design time, and it requires a very good architect. But the result is individuality, and I think that's worth a lot more money than off-the-peg housing, and we should have a lot more of it. I really think we should. Have you ever wondered why so many architects don't live in the houses they design? Hmm. Well, one of the reasons that architects don't live in new houses is that older ones often represent better value for money and are more comfortable to live in. They're like old clothes, they're old shoes. There's lots of space, there's lots of interesting detail. They have a sense of history, a sense of place. The craftsmanship is often better, the materials are bigger, the size of the rooms is better. This is in fact a very uh, happy family home. We've had four children here, Margaret and I, and brought them up. And it's been big enough to allow a variety of activities. Six bedrooms, three floors, a separate basement where we've had parties and where the laundry is now. Space to, to really enjoy. We've been very fortunate in living in a house like this. Now, if we tried to do a modern one, we wouldn't have been able to afford as much space. And I have tried once or twice and not succeeded. And uh, perhaps later on it would be interesting to do one. But the nice thing about a house like this is you can do a, a variety of things. And in fact, this is my cave. Here I am, with, surrounded by nostalgia. Things that are to do with holidays. Things that are to do with collecting bits, which is, which is enjoyable. I mean, your background, you, you reflect your identity in the house you live in. This, this is the room where I do some work. It's the room where I've collected things. Here's my uh, Burne Jones window of a, a well-known pre-Raphaelite beauty. And up here is perhaps my favourite piece of stained glass, which I saved from St Mary's Birkenhead, which was demolished. Well, it wasn't entirely demolished. They kept the spire, luckily, as a landmark. It's near Camel Lairds. And St Mary's Birkenhead was built in 1825, a cast iron church of some interest. But the glass here, and it's unusual to have a piece of religious glass in a house because the church doesn't give it away. This was, in fact, left at the top of the window just before the demolition. And I went up a 40-foot swaying ladder to get that out with a hammer and chisel, and I was scared stiff. And I'm glad I saved it from the hammers, because it's there, perhaps to be incorporated in another religious building somewhere, someday. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. It should say on women as well, by the way. In fact, I'd better etch it in the glass underneath that, or put it in in letter set. Better still, etch it in the glass on a house I will build someday, because I would like that, in fact, to be incorporated in a house I build. It's splendid glass. Rickman was the architect, 1825. Superb piece of craftsmanship. If there should be built and opened in any of our large cities today a commodious and well-served apartment house for professional women with families, it would be filled at once. The apartments would be without kitchens, but there would be a kitchen belonging to the house from which meals could be served to the families in their rooms or in a common dining room as preferred. It would be a home where the cleaning was done by efficient workers, not hired separately by the families, but engaged by the manager of the establishment, and a roof garden, day nursery and kindergarten, under well-trained professional nurses and teachers, would ensure proper care of the children. This must be offered on a business basis to prove a substantial business success. And so it will prove, for it is a growing social need. In suburban homes, this purpose could be accomplished much better by a grouping of adjacent houses, each distinct and having its own yard, but all kitchenless and connected by covered ways with the eating house, common libraries and parlours, baths and gymnasia, workroom and playrooms, to which both sexes have the same access for the same needs. Sounds very modern. In fact, it was written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman in an American magazine called Women and Economics in 1898. This, in fact, is from a, this year's book, The Second Stage by Betty Frieden, which some of you may have read. 
Now, the interesting thing is that idea isn't as silly as it sounds, and I think this sort of thing will happen in future. It's very difficult to know whether architects should try and initiate it, because then it might fail. But if groups of people could get together on certain sites, still have enough identity and enough of their own private space, but then share other things, like a swimming pool, like a big communal party room, like a big kitchen, which if it didn't work, could be made into something else, like a workroom or a garage, or perhaps converted to another house. And if we could approach problems very creatively, I think there'll be a lot of interesting opportunities in future. We haven't seen the end of the development of the house, and dreams like this, which are very expensive to maintain, I might tell you, this might have to be split into flats someday in the future, will change. Let's look to the future with some interest. There's going to be plenty of different patterns of living. Well, in that programme, Ken Martin...